In the next few videos, we're going to be talking about complex numbers. A uh, complex number, it's a little different than a regular number, so it has two parts. It has a real part, which is just a regular number, like 1, 2, pi, negative 3.4, negative 10 over whatever. Yeah, just a regular number. It also has an imaginary part. imaginary <laughs> part, which is just a regular number, but times i. So 1i pi i negative 7i square root of 8i, whatever. So where i is what we call the square root of negative 1. And if you remember back, we said we couldn't really take square roots of negative numbers because if you take a regular number and square it, well, it's either positive times positive, which is positive, or it's negative times negative, which is positive. So there's no way if you square something, you get a negative. So you shouldn't be able to take the square root of a negative. But sometimes we need to take the square root of a negative, so we make one up. So we made the square root of negative 1 number up. And you might ask, well, how can we go about just making up numbers? Aren't numbers supposed to count things and whatnot? And I'm going to tell you a truth that you may not have ever heard. In fact, we made all the numbers up. There is no such thing as a number. We somehow figured out that numbers are useful for doing some things in logic, and so we made them all up. And in this video, I'm not going to really tell you much about complex numbers. I'm just going to give you a little history and show you how we went about making all these numbers up. All right, so first of all, uh, let me just tell you that this kind of bias in terms of the words has been around forever. So the first numbers that we had were the rational numbers, which rational number just means anything that can be written as a fraction. So uh, 2, 5, 3 over 8. And basically the, the 2 and the 5 were made up when people started counting things. And things like 3 over 8 were made up when people started dividing into pieces. And that was considered a really natural thing to do, so everybody was happy. But then people discovered there were some numbers that you can't get from dividing these natural numbers into pieces. And so since we wanted to convey that these numbers were evil somehow, we called the regular numbers rational, and we called these new numbers irrational. So irrational numbers are like square root of 2, pi, later on in this class we'll see something called e. These are all numbers that cannot be written as fractions. And because people didn't like that, they gave it a really biased name. All right. Well, life went on for a while until at some point we decided, you know, it'd be convenient to have some numbers that are less than zero. At that time, the only numbers people talked about were the ones that were bigger than zero. When we invented numbers less than zero, we said, hey, are good old fashioned numbers both rational and irrational? 2, 5, 3, 8, square root 2, pi, e. All these numbers that are bigger than 0, we're going to call them the positive numbers. These numbers less than 0, we're going to call them negative numbers. And then history repeats itself. Eventually we wanted to take square roots of negatives. There weren't any numbers we had around to do that. So all the numbers we already had, both positive and negative, we decided to start calling them real numbers. And these square root of negatives, we decided to call the imaginary numbers. But as biased as these terms are, really none of the numbers are real. We've made up all the numbers. So, it's really 
just kind of, yeah, all it is is language. <laughs> Truth is, none of the numbers really exist. And to prove that, let me go back to everybody's favorite, the natural numbers. So, natural numbers came about when people started grouping things together. So if I showed you a group of some people and asked you what is it, what would you say? Would you say that this is equal to 3? No. I mean, if I showed you this group and asked you what is it, you would say, these are people. Same thing if I show you three rocks. Okay. I'm not an artist, so rocks are about the best thing I can draw. You would say, hey, those are rocks. If I give you ideas, so. And again, I'm not an artist, so there's my bright ideas. You would say, oh, those are ideas. Where did the number three came from? Well, the number three came about when people started making groups. And if you put groups together, or if you split groups up, then you naturally kind of get the idea of, oh, this is adding and this is subtracting. And people figured out pretty quick, if you're grouping things together, or if you're splitting groups up, what happens kind of doesn't depend on what the group's made of. It could be made of people or rocks or ideas or whatnot. All that really matters is kind of the size of the group. So they needed to make up some words that describe the size of the group. And so they made up three to describe. I mean, the group is made up of people. But they made up this number three to describe how big the group is. And they figured out, hey, it doesn't matter what the group's made of. All that really matters is this size. So that's how we made up the natural numbers. And again, the rational numbers were made up whenever people started taking rationals, and, or sorry, started taking your natural numbers and dividing them in parts. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'll go there. Same thing. These irrational numbers that people didn't like because they weren't fractions, people were forced upon them because they needed them. So in geometry, uh, the ancient Egyptians knew if you wanted to make a right angle, you just get a triangle, make it 3, 4, and 5, and then this winds up being 90 degrees. A little later on, the Pythagoreans, said, well, it's really the same thing. If you have A, B, and C, then this is a right angle if A squared plus B squared is C squared. And vice versa. If this is a right angle, then A squared plus B squared is C squared. Well, that was all fine until they said, well, what happens if you have a triangle that's 1 and 1? Then this would be square root of 2. It's 1 squared plus 1 squared is 2. Square root of that. And then a guy named Euclid came along and said square root of 2 is not a fraction. So up until that point, where you got numbers was from counting things or possibly dividing groups into pieces. So counting was natural numbers, dividing into pieces, that gave you fractions. But... Euclid said, hey, there's this number that comes out in geometry that's not a fraction. So we were kind of forced to accept these irrational numbers. So we called them irrational and eventually got used to them. And that's basically what happens. Uh, same thing with negative numbers. Negative numbers originally were just kind of convenient because they made algebra simple. but Eventually, people said, oh, a negative number is like a debt. So once we got used to some picture of what a negative number looked like, just like the triangle gave us a picture of an irrational number, we decided to say these guys were okay, too. What makes complex numbers tricky is that 
there's not just a whole lot of obvious ways to see them. And there's you don't see them in the real world. Or at least you don't for a while. So the last thing I want to tell you is just kind of three places where you actually do see these imaginary numbers. One is solving cubic equations. So uh, just for time's sake, I'm not going to really go into this. But there's a quadratic formula that we're going to learn next unit for solving quadratic equations. There's another formula for solving cubic equations by a guy named Cardano. And it turns out if you have three real roots, so, I mean, the most real number scenario you can imagine, you have to use complex numbers to get those real roots. I mean, if you plug in the formula, you you get complex numbers on the way and all the imaginary stuff cancels, but there's no way to use this formula without using the complex numbers. So after Cardano did that, math people said, well, these numbers might not exist, but at least they're useful for some things. Uh, then fast forward a couple hundred years, and we have a guy named Maxwell who had his theory of electromagnetism. And it was many, 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 like hundreds of pages long. But the math guys took it after he wrote it, just in long words, and realized if you use complex numbers, and another type of number that we'll talk about later on in the class called a matrix, you could condense his hundreds of pages into like 15 pages. So, again... You could do Maxwell's electromagnetism just with real numbers, but life was a whole lot simpler if you throw complex numbers into the mix as well. Well, just a couple decades after that, one more guy came along uh, named Heisenberg, and he invented quantum mechanics. And if you've ever seen anything about quantum mechanics, the starting point is the equation QP minus PQ equals I H bar. So this is a number called Planck's constant. It's just some physical thing of the universe. It's some specific number. This I is square root of negative 1. So, like it or not, there is no way possible to imagine quantum mechanics without these complex numbers. There's just no way around it. So, yeah, they're weird, but on the other hand, we made up all the numbers. And as weird as they are, we actually do need them if we want to understand how this universe works. So, so don't be afraid of them. They're a little strange because they have two parts instead of one. But basically, they work just like all the other numbers that you know and love.